Good afternoon and welcome. We are hosting Dr. Ronesh Sinha, author of the book, The South Asian Health Solution. Dr. Ronesh Sinha is a doctor at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. But more importantly, he has had this principal mission of trying to address a set of preventable diseases that human beings can address by taking care of themselves, taking care of themselves in making choices about what we eat how we move our bodies in terms of exercise and understanding specific cultural factors that might be affecting issues like diabetes, heart attack, excess weight. Early on in his career, Dr. Sinha was noticing that while he worked in this part of the world, that employees in certain industries and from certain ethnicities seemed to have the exact same problem. For example, the incidence of diabetes or certain kind of heart conditions among South Asian populations, or that Pacific Islanders were susceptible to uh, certain diseases. And he started studying it. And he started seeing you know, patients coming from tech companies in particular uh, with implications on lifestyle also having these sort of issues. So when he started researching it, he found that there were cultural factors, for example, what we eat or what you know, traditionally certain cultures have eaten has had a huge impact and he started educating these populations, and that has become his mission in teaching groups of people from certain backgrounds on what to eat, how to exercise, and how you can be the CEO of your own uh, body and your own peak performance and productivity. Dr. Sin is a well-known speaker, blogger, author, and I would consider himself as almost like a missionary in this area. He's got a sense of purpose more than just being a doctor at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. So it's my honor to welcome to the stage Dr. Sinha. Great. Thank you. All right, so let's jump into the I'm going to warn you ahead of time. My talks are pretty information packed, so sit back and get ready for a ride. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. But um, you have access to a lot of this content. I will make a handout version of this and send this out to you. I've got talks online. So I'm really here not to really tell you the what. I think most of you know what you're supposed to eat. We will definitely talk about that. I'm armed with an amazing dietitian to talk to you about that. But I want to talk also about the why. Like, how did we arrive here? Why do patients of mine that have all the right knowledge still refuse to make the changes that they need to make to make themselves healthier and their families healthier? So it is going to be part information. It's also going to be part motivation as well. And then when Perrin and I are finished, um, we'll have a lot of time to answer questions as well too. So hopefully we can accomplish quite a bit here. So how did we get here? What's your risk type? So one of the things that I'm passionate about in the clinic is identifying what your risk type is so you can personalize your diet appropriately. The right diet for me might be the absolutely wrong diet for you and vice versa. And if we don't understand that, we might be doing things that we think are making us healthier, but actually might be leading to more damage. We'll talk about some key lifestyle changes to implement, and then we're gonna to transition to Perner for the um, nutrition practical tips. So this is one slide I like to show, because many of my patients who are Asian in background tell me, how can you take away my rice? You know, oh, well, let's get back here, okay. And you know, they ask me, you know, this is a lifestyle that I led before. I was eating all these foods. How can we take that away? And I'm never there to take away people's cultural foods at all, but I do remind them that we have a significant difference from our ancestors or people who are living back in Asia. So a typical rickshaw puller, so I'm obsessed with rickshaw pullers. When I grew up in Calcutta, I'd go to India every summer, and we had a house that was right in front of a rickshaw stand. So I used to check these guys out. I probably saw more than I should have, but I saw every part of their life. But basically, an average rickshaw puller will walk about 40,000 steps, walk and run 40,000 steps a day. My average engineer is, because I track their steps like a vital sign, about two to 3,000 steps. So they're 20 times less active than a rickshaw puller. They obviously have a strong leg and core because they're carting around lots of loads, including heavier families as well, too, because India obesity is becoming an issue. So they definitely have a strong leg and core, but we have a weak leg and core because we're sitting in front of a computer all day. Normal vitamin D levels because they're out in the sun with minimal clothing exposure, so they're getting that natural sunlight-driven vitamin D, whereas here we have an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency, and vitamin D affects metabolism, inflammation, and other parts of our health. So for somebody with this sort of lifestyle, Moderate to high amounts of rice, awesome, great. It's gonna fuel this engine so he can do his work during the day. But if we're sitting in front of a computer all day, that same sort of diet 
can lead to early onset diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer and Alzheimer's disease as well. So I'm not saying that you're going to drop your jobs and become rickshaw pullers, pulling rickshaws down the 101, but there is <laughs> there's a happy medium where we can sort of come to some sort of a compromise. So there's a concept called ancestral drift, and what that basically means is how much have we deviated from our native lifestyle? So microbiome is basically the composition of the bacteria inside our gut and digestive tract, which you might be aware of. A lot of us that have migrated from a different country like India or China have come here. We had a certain type of bacteria that inhabited our digestive tracts, and that abruptly, dramatically shifts within the first year when you first started eating at a high-tech cafeteria, etc. And that can have dramatic implications. If you've been raised in a Western lifestyle, your gut has had an opportunity to adapt. It's still not healthy, but the impact may not be as dramatic. The second thing is this caloric mismatch. So for a lot of us of Asian background, you might see us walking around. We might be slender arms and legs, and we got a nice little pot belly here. Because really, genetically, we've been programmed to store more fat around our stomach because we live through periods of feast and famine. And during situations of famine, your body stores more body fat. And this is our Tupperware container. We store it right here. So during the winter and limited access to calorie, we can actually break that down for energy. But what do we do here in the wintertime? We feast even more, right? So we don't empty our Tupperware, and we store more and more fat around that area. So that's caloric mismatch. We call that the thrifty gene. The elimination of traditional rituals. So the thing I find in my consult practice, I probably see 60 70% patients from Indian Asian background. The rest are Western Europeans. One of the questions I ask all of them is, what do you do for stress reduction? Do you meditate? Do you do mindfulness practices? Do you do yoga? And it's unbelievable. I find my Westerners are meditating much more than my patients that come from the land of yoga. Most of my Indians are doing absolutely no meditation or mindfulness practices at all. And that was a part of their traditional, their fam familial ritual, and they've disconnected from that completely. All of us can use that regardless of cultural background, but if you've come from a culture, your genes are from that land and you've ditched that altogether, it's going to have a more dramatic impact on emotional and physical health. And then the social structure is a mismatch because many of us come from communities where it's more what we call a village. Extended family members living, neighbors knew each other, you know the person at the local market. And then we get pulled out of that into a very isolated environment, and that can have profound impacts on metabolic, physical, and emotional health. So this is what I refer to as ancestral drift. So the key is how do we bridge the gap, right? We can't go all the way this way, but how are some of the ways that we can really bring in some of these ancestral habits? So the first step is to understand what is your particular risk type. So let's talk about this. And there's a lot of variations in what our risk types are. These are three categories I tend to focus on. Number one, do you have an insulin-resistant type risk profile? Number two, are you somebody who's more susceptible to inflammation and autoimmunity? And we'll talk about that concept in detail. And the third one is a simpler one, but are you somebody ten who tends to have a type of cholesterol called LDL, elevated levels of that? So we're going to talk about each of these categories, and I'm going to explain to you how we can tailor our lifestyle to address those individually. And this covers the vast majority of people that we see in the clinic. So the first thing is insulin resistance. You've probably heard of the term. This is the root cause for type 2 diabetes, for most heart disease, for most obesity, and also we're finding for cancer and conditions like Alzheimer's disease also. So this is an image from my book, and I, I want to spend a little time so you understand this. I tell people that insulin resistance is a carbohydrate parking problem. So let's call excess carbs in the diet, let's call that a car in the middle of the diagram. We have three parking lots. We have our muscle, liver, and fat. And the ideal destination for the carbohydrates is we want the carb car to drive to muscle so your muscle can burn that for energy. The way the carbs get inside the muscle is by using a hormone called insulin. That's a parking pass. It's the key that gets the carbs through the muscle door. When we say we have insulin resistance, all that means is your body is producing the parking pass, but the muscle is resistant. It's not responding to the signal. As a result of that, we have all this overflow carb traffic, and that flows to various other sites. It can go to the fat parking lot. When it goes to the fat parking lot, often it gets stored in the stomach. That leads to weight gain, inflammation, and worsening insulin resistance, fatigue, and other issues. It might go to the liver, and the liver will predominantly take the carbs and make dangerous cholesterol particles out of it, like triglycerides. And then in a lot of people, it stays in the bloodstream. So they might have high blood sugar, prediabetes, or diabetes. So when I see insulin-resistant people in the clinic, it depends on each person. So for example, I saw three couples today, actually, in my clinic. And one of the common things we see is we see the man and the woman. The male is often very slender. 
but he's got very high triglycerides, cholesterol, and very high dark heart disease risk. So in his case, his carbs tend to flow more to the liver where you can't see it, but it's accumulating in his bloodstream, okay? But he's skinny. He's walking around going, hey, I can eat all the carbs I want. Look at me. His mom's like, you got to eat more food, but they don't realize it. The problem's getting worse. The spouse, on the other hand, often, the traffic is not going to the liver, so her numbers look amazing, but she's 30 to 40 pounds overweight because most of her traffic is going to her fat storage. Very common pattern. But then as women reach perimenopause and menopause, it starts to go in this direction. All of a sudden, heart disease risk escalates tremendously. So this is the distribution that varies in each person, but now you understand how insulin resistance functions in our body. So what are some clues that you might have a parking problem? In, uh, in other words, insulin resistance. You look at a type of cholesterol test called the triglycerides. Most labs will say greater than 150 um, is abnormal, but I tell people aim for 100 or less. That's really what you should be looking at because that can really bring down a lot of the visceral abdominal fat. HDL is the healthy cholesterol. The target for males less than 40, for females less than 50, okay? I'm sorry, these are not the targets, these are the risks. If you're less than 40 or less than 50, that shows you might have a carbohydrate traffic problem as well. So you wanna get above those levels. And these two tend to be tied hand in hand. The higher your triglycerides are, it pushes down your healthy cholesterol. Body habitus, people that carry more fat around the stomach, elevated waist circumference, that's a sign you probably have insulin resistance. Then blood sugar markers like the glucose or a test called the A1C, those are indicators, and also the blood pressure as well. So a lot of our folks we see unfortunately have all or most of these, or even if you have a couple of these, those are early, early indicators. Other insulin type clues could be your ethnic background. So certain ethnicities, we talked about how we have that caloric mismatch, the thrifty genes, so Asian Indians, East Asians, Hispanics, Pacific Islanders, there can be some what I call non-specific overlap symptoms. So men and women who are having difficulty losing weight, having a lot of fatigue, a lot of sugar cravings, they can be insulin resistant or insulin type. And then if you have other existing conditions, they tell us that you probably have insulin resistance. So diabetes or prediabetes, a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is becoming an epidemic in young women, gestational diabetes, fatty liver, et cetera. So these are some conditions, yes. So I'm sorry, yeah, so the question is why people with insulin resistance have sugar cravings. And the whole issue of that is when your muscles are resistant to insulin, your body actually responds by producing more insulin. And the insulin, what it does is it drops your sugar down. So it's not a perfect system. It'd be ideal if it just brought it to a certain level. But when you're constantly flooding insulin to push the glucose into the muscle parking lot, often it bottoms out. So during the day, your brain goes between high sugar, normal to low sugar, and those fluctuations cause, we call it the carb roller coaster, the sugar roller coaster. So that's how hunger gets generated. All right, great. So this is a sample example, okay? So to figure out, so one of the reasons we have a parking problem, many of us have a parking problem, is when you flood the muscles with a consistent amount of high carbohydrates, the muscle gets tired. It's like, I cannot take on any more carbohydrates. So here's a typical example from my book. I tell people that normally for most of our sedentary workers, if we consume more than 100, 150 grams of net carbohydrates. So net carbohydrates is your total carbs minus the fiber. That usually promotes a lot of fat storage in the body. But most people are not mindful of what that looks like. So here's a typical patient, okay? And she's having a chapati, that's 24 grams of net carb, right? One cup of cooked lentils, great source of protein, but you do have three times more carb per unit protein. And then one cup of cooked alu sabji, which is a potato curry. So this in one meal sounds pretty innocent. There's no fat, nothing. Turns out to be almost 100 grams of carb, which is what I consume over maybe a one to one and a half day period total, right? This is one meal. So in this particular scenario, the muscles are completely flooded on a regular basis and they cannot respond to the insulin signal. And that's why we're having all these issues. So just to give you a snapshot of what that looks like. So this is one mnemonic I use in my South Asian patients, and I'm not saying we have to eliminate these foods, we have to pay attention to it. So carbs, right? C is for chapatis, which represents flatbreads, Indian flatbreads or any breads. A is alu for potatoes or starchy vegetables. R is for rice or rice-like grains. B is for beans and lentils. And S is for sugar and sweets. So if we do the right combination and moderate the intake of those foods, we can reverse or significantly impact that metabolic traffic problem. Okay, so I'm by no means telling people you have to eliminate these, but this is what we're thinking about. So net carbs, NC, is your total grams of carb minus fiber. 
So in my work, I tell people bargain foods are foods that we want to consume. Bargain foods are foods that have a low net carb and maximal nutrients in return. So things like vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Expensive foods that cause more health damage are foods that have high net carbs and little to no nutrients like white rice, noodles, flour, etc. So that's how you sort of think about this. So the other thing I want to bring up is in terms, so I told you a lot of insulin resistance is coming from the types of foods that we're eating, but it's also rooted in the types of pregnancies our moms or even our grandparents had. It has a genetic effect. So what we see in a lot of Asians, for example, is there's a lot of traditions around pregnancy. When my Indian patients get pregnant, what happens? Mom or mother-in-law flies out. They tell them, please don't move too much, just stay in bed, and I'll make you these foods that will make your kids smarter and healthier, okay? So I'll make you these rolls, these ladoos, and all those types of things. And so women ends up gaining a lot of weight, and then what happens is her body is already producing a lot of insulin. We have epidemic gestational diabetes in Asian and Indian pregnancies. And when there's a lot of insulin, what that does is it robs nutrients away from the child, from the baby. So often we see very undernourished, underweight Asian and Indian babies and kids. And then what happens? Oh my God, your kid's too skinny. So let's overfeed the heck out of them so they can come to their normal curve. Because when, when Indian families look at growth curves in the pediatrician's office, they treat them like academic curves. My kid can't be at the 60th percentile. 60th percentile, i got to take them to 90 or 100th percentile. So my wife, who's a pediatrician, sees this. And the thing is, if you take an underweight child and you rapidly accelerate them to 80, 90th percentile, guess what's happening? You've turned on the thrifty gene. They're programmed for life to store more fat around their stomach now. So a lot of what we're doing is becoming programmed in, the, in, in utero and also early in childhood. And the good news is you can still reverse that at any stage of life, but why start that problem in the first place? So fetal mal malnutrition leads to low birth weight babies, which leads to overeating modern lifestyles, and that perpetuates the cycle of multi-generational diabetes and chronic health conditions. Okay? I wanted to highlight real quick that there is a direct correlation. Now, this is no longer theoretical. Insulin resistance, we used to think of just being prediabetes, linked to heart disease, directly linked to Alzheimer's disease. Undoubtedly, I've talked to Alzheimer's researchers. Now they're calling Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes because of the strong correlation. I wanna spend a couple of moments here, and one of the things that happens, a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is you get these plaques in the brain called amyloid. When your body is insulin resistant, you produce excess insulin, and that prevents your brain from clearing that chemical. So you can't clear the amyloid, and your risk of Alzheimer's goes up. The hippocampus, a central structure that's your GPS navigator, your memory storage unit, is shrunken in people that have insulin resistance. It's smaller. It shrinks. Diabetics, this one's stunning, are 50% more likely to develop Alzheimer's than non-diabetics. Now, I'm not telling all diabetics. Obviously, there's other lifestyle factors. There are some genetics. But now we're calling pre-diabetes pre-Alzheimer's. So something to be aware of, because I feel like a lot of our community is desensitized. Many patients tell me, oh, every Indian gets diabetes. What can I do? I'm going to enjoy life and do whatever. But listen, if you're, diabetes isn't scary. Alzheimer's is better, because the rates are going up like crazy, and we're seeing a lot of dementia earlier ages. So I did a dedicated blog post on this if you want to learn more. But it, it does definitely have implications for brain health. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, really briefly, this is an insulin-resistant condition in young women, teens. These are a lot of the common signs and symptoms that we see from this. I also did a blog post here, but a lot of this is lifestyle-focused, so we have to be really aware of this condition. A lot of young women are having this, and when they have polycystic ovarian syndrome early on, it can lead to a lot of issues with infertility and um, gestational diabetes and diabetes later on in life. So what is inflammation, okay? So basically, when we talk about the inflammation body type, so if you were to twist your ankle, that's visible inflammation. Your ankle is swollen, it's painful, and it's red. And that's protective because if your ankle wasn't swollen and painful, you might do something to tear the ligaments. So that's a good thing. We need inflammation in the body. But unfortunately, when people actually activate their immune system on a chronic basis, it can lead to other types of symptoms. So this is a very long list here. But these are the types of symptoms that might indicate inflammation. This varies for each person. For a lot of people, the inflammation comes from their skin. They're developing rashes, eczema. It can come from their muscles and joints, like arthritis, aches and pains. A lot of inflammation is in the digestive system, because that's where most of our immune system sits. So Prana and I see a lot of patients with a lot of chronic bloating, acidity, constipation, loose stools. Brain-type symptoms can be headaches, migraines, memory, brain fog-type symptoms. Overlap symptoms are the same symptoms we saw with insulin resistance, like fatigue and difficulty losing weight. 
And then there's a whole host of autoimmune conditions. We're seeing a lot of thyroid disease. That's when your immune system actually attacks your thyroid gland, and then you have to take thyroid medications, rheumatoid, etc. So lots of issues, and inflammation just has such an adverse effect on all parts of life, but this, most of this is really lifestyle-induced. Now, the third type, okay, is the high LDL, and I just want to bring this up because a lot of my patients, for example, might be on low-carb, ketogenic, high-fat type diets, but be aware that some people are very LDL sensitive. That's a type of cholesterol in your bloodstream, and some of our patients have very high LDL cholesterols, and we have to manage it through diet, but a lot of it's also coming from disrupted gut health, so they have to eat more gut-friendly foods, which we'll talk about they have to really consider a significant reduction in animal meat, dairy, and shift to more plants. So again, a lot of people eating low-carb or ketogenic type diets might be eating a lot of meat, a lot of butter, a lot of ghee, a lot of coconut oil and saturated fat. That can really raise up the LDL. And then genes obviously can play a role. So we are gonna get, you know, later on I'll talk about a case study, um, but definitely there are cases where we get concerned about the high LDL risk type, okay? So I kind of liken this, so I tell people when it comes to your genes, Think of them as being light switches or apps on your phone. Many of us have inherited a type 2 app from our you know, type 2 diabetes app, maybe obesity app or an Alzheimer's disease app. But the thing is, when my patients see me and they tell me all of my siblings, my parents have been diabetic, I'm probably going to get diabetes too. What I tell them is, yes, you have the same app, but your parents were eating a type of diet or leading a lifestyle that turned that app on. You can leave it off. And the things, the inputs that can turn those apps on or off are things like food, specific micronutrient deficiencies like vitamin D, magnesium, inactivity, stress, sleep deprivation, toxin exposure. So we clearly see when we, our patients make the right changes, they're the first generation that does not develop diabetes. Now the converse is true too. Many of our patients, no family history of diabetes, heart disease, cancers, nothing. And here, they're the first one to develop diabetes, the first one to develop heart disease or breast cancer, et cetera. Because again, they have the app, their traditional ancestors didn't turn the app on because they led a healthier life, but now with their high stress lifestyle, their diet, they've turned on the apps for health conditions. We're seeing this also in young kids. A lot of families, parents, no type two diabetes, kids at age nine or 10, developing adult onset type two diabetes has become an epidemic in our community. Okay, so with heart disease specifically, we know now about insulin resistance, we know about inflammation. When those two converge, it leads to plaque formation, the plaque that blocks off the blood vessels. And that process can come, it starts in the first decade of life, okay? So already, if you've got young kids, if we don't address these conditions early on, we're already starting that cycle of plaque formation. So really keep that in mind. So a quick example here. This is not a real guy, but just a sample. These numbers are a little bit changed for you, but let's take this guy. Sam, he's a 38-year-old software engineer, eats a vegetarian diet, has a body mass index of 24, which would be cons uh, considered normal by general standards, normal blood pressure and blood sugar, total cholesterol level of 190, which might sound good because it's less than 200, goes to the gym, but he's otherwise sedentary and work stress is high. Does this sound like anybody here? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Can people connect to this? So Sam, unfortunately, had a massive heart attack while jogging at Rancho San Antonio. Okay, he's a runner, he trains for half marathons, and this ended up happening. So now let's understand his numbers a little bit better here. Let's look at his total cholesterol. His results are 190, so most doctors might look at that and say, hey, that looks pretty good. I tell most people total cholesterol is a very misleading number in most cases. I don't tend to focus on that. Let's look at the components, the subcomponents. LDL cholesterol is 108. Most people would say target level less than 100 or less than 130. So a lot of people would say that's okay. 108 is a pretty good number. HDL, H stands for the healthy, remember? So HDL for this guy, we'd want it above 40, but his is low, it's at 32. Triglycerides is a number we're really focused on. I say less than 100 is ideal. This guy's number was 250. So I'm telling you, a lot of traditional doctors would look at these numbers and say, hey, total cholesterol is not bad. LDL is okay. Hey, he's exercising. His body weight's not too bad. He's all right. But the numbers I want you to focus on are the ratios, not the absolutes. So the first one is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. This is not on your lab reports usually. You take the triglycerides. You divide by the healthy cholesterol. You want it to be less than 3.0. His number was almost at 8. Okay? The total cholesterol divided by the HDL should be less than 4. Less than 3.5 would be even better. His ratio came back at 5.9. So if I had seen this guy before this, I would have said he's very high risk. But standard doctors and standard approaches would not flag this. But these ratios are critical. And then this test is a marker for inflammation. 
this number should be low and his inflammation level came back high. So these two things tell me, especially this, he's got a parking problem, he's insulin resistant, and this number happens to tell me he's got inflammation. These two elements came together, it led to plaque formation, it led to his heart attack while he was running. And I summarized some of these changes here. One thing I want to tell you about the C-reactor protein, a lot of people have inflammation in their body and their CRP test will be normal. Because many people rush out and tell their doc, let me get a CRP. But most people actually that have a lot of inflammation, this test may not capture it. When it's high, I'm concerned. But if it's normal, it doesn't give me false protection that there's no inflammation in the body. Doctor. Yes. Can you talk about the last number? I have typically not seen that in my yeah, so this is not, this is a separate test. And I don't recommend everyone gets it, but when I see people that already have insulin resistance and other risk factors, I order that separately. But yeah, thanks for asking that. It's not part of a normal profile, but it's a very easy test to order if, if the risk factors are there. Okay, so now based on this, which types of meals do you think spike insulin and inflammation more? The Indian sort of vegetarian diet, right? So this is our token traditional meal. I always tell people the cucumbers and tomatoes are decorative. We don't really eat those. They just sit on the sport of the plate. And then everything else on it, those four golf balls are Indian sweets. You got flatbreads, got all these round mounds of carbohydrates, right? But hey, it's a vegan vegetarian type diet. It should be fine, right? But now we know how much this can spike insulin and inflammation. You know, here in the Bay Area, we're eating a lot of diverse type dishes. So a lot of my vegetarians are eating foods like this. But, you know, obviously, if you can't eat fish, we have to find other proteins, and Prana will talk about that. But these are the meals that are triggering a lot of the health conditions that we end up seeing. Okay, so at a high level, we want to remove foods that increase insulin, that increase inflammation, that are turning on the wrong apps on our genes. Those are foods like sugar and fructose, dangerous fats, trans fats, and most vegetable oils. Artificial sweeteners, which are popping up in a lot of different foods, Extra carbohydrates, even good carbs. So in my practice in Los Altos, people are not getting heart disease off pizza and Coke. Most of the execs and patients that I see are getting heart disease and diabetes from eating too much quinoa, too much whole wheat bread, too much steel cut oats. So even those healthy carbs in abundance will trigger a parking problem. Not as badly as if they're having sugars and sweets, but really keep that in mind. Healthy carbs can get in trouble. We have limited capacity in our muscle parking lot. And then other potential culprits for many might be gluten and dairy, which can trigger inflammation. So keep these sort of categories of foods in mind. So oils are a big issue. So I don't want to underwhelm this. I know I've talked a lot about carbs and sugar, but they're the types of oils in our diet that we should be eating more of are the omega-3s because they're anti-inflammatory, they lower inflammation, they're heart protective. But unfortunately, a lot of us are consuming too much of a different type of oil called the omega-6. So in the old days, if you were to look at our ancestral diet and how much omega-6 to how much omega-3 we're eating, it was about a one to two ratio. So I'm sorry, one part omega-3 to about two parts omega-6. But now we're eating at a ratio of about 20, 1 to 20. So we're eating about 20 times, 16 to 20 times more omega-6 and omega-3. Why is that important? Because when we're eating the foods that raise omega-6s, those oils get trapped inside our cell membrane. Our cells physiologically change. And the effects of that, when you talk to lab scientists, biochemists, they say it's like nuclear radiation. When those cell membranes change from these types of oils, it can promote cancer, diabetes, a lot of these health conditions. And the thing is, once your cell membranes change, it could take nine months to 12 months to reverse that. So I'm telling you this because a lot of the health foods out there have the omega-6 oils in it, and it's tremendously impacting our cell membrane health. The omega-3s we want to enhance, so simply, without measuring this by an advanced lab test, if we're getting rid of a lot of the processed foods, Prana will talk about that, that have the omega-6, and boost the uh, 3s that have these um, natural food sources, you're going to optimize that ratio. And many people, after six to nine months, feel completely great. They feel like their memory's back, brain fog is gone, their health has gotten significantly better just by modifying that ratio. Now, again, to highlight, yes, question? Uh, can you see the top, so, the of omega-6? So the omega-6 is basically any of the, pro so it's coming mostly from vegetable oils, right? So whether you're cooking with vegetable oils like canola or safflower or any of these oils, or if you're eating any processed foods or snacks, we have pictures of mayonnaise or a lot of packaged foods. If you look at the back, if it says canola, soybean oil, which is commonly used, those are all omega-6s. So it's not going to say omega-6 on the package. You're looking for those specific oils. That's a key thing. And Perna, you'll be talking about that as well too, right? Yeah. Great. So dangers of diet foods, keep in mind now with the low carb movement, many low carb or gluten free packaged foods have tons of omega-6s, which will alter your cell membranes. 
Many low-carb or gluten-free packaged foods have artificial sweeteners, which yes, they will not cause an elevation in your blood sugar, but they feed the wrong gut bacteria and that leads to more inflammation. So again, you're gonna to stick to eating the most natural foods possible and be diligent about scanning those nutrition labels or you're gonna miss some of these foods. So again, foods that lower inflammation, foods that prevent insulin resistance, foods with the greatest nutrient density. So let's talk about a few of these. So these are some categories and I, again, Sorry, vegetarians and vegans, I'm putting this up here, but organ meats, liver, etc., incredibly nutrient dense. Shellfish, very nutrient dense as well. Sardines, including the bones and organs. Herbs and spices, unbelievable anti inflammatories, especially turmeric. As you know, bone broth has become very popular as well, and now it's very easy. There's a lot of, you know, you can buy jarred bone broths, you can order them, but they're rich in cartilage and other anti inflammatory substances that are great for overall health. Egg yolks, you know, so don't throw the yolks away. A lot of B vitamins and antioxidants in that. And sprouts, especially broccoli sprouts, are gr some great nutrient-dense power foods you can include in your diet. So when we talk about gut health, there's two different types, and this clearly makes a big difference in our clinic. So prebiotic foods are foods that you eat that will feed the right healthy bacteria in your gut. So I put the categories up here, things like onions and leeks and dandelion greens, garlic, asparagus. These all feed the healthy bacteria in our intestines. Just by feeding the right bacteria, you can lower inflammation in the body. So these are prebiotics, so we call this fertilizer. We're fertilizing the right bacteria. Now probiotic foods are foods that actually have the bacteria. So it's not the food for the bacteria, it's the bacteria itself. And dairy, yogurt, kefir, lassi, cheese, East Asian foods, a lot of traditional foods like kimchi, natto, miso, kombucha, Indian foods, so pickled chutneys, idli, dosa, utapam, in moderation, dhokla, lassi, as long as it's not the sweetened type. Those are fermented foods and others pickled and um, sauerkraut type foods. Now, do keep in mind that many of the probiotic foods now on the market are high in sugar, okay? So you might be consuming carbs from that. I've seen box cereals that actually now have Probiotics. I think they're putting probiotics in Oreo cookies now, so don't get <laughs> fooled by this. Again, the food industry will always be able to take a health trend and turn it poisonous, okay? So be careful, read those labels, but these are our natural traditional foods that can really um, change our gut bacteria in a positive way. So one question I get from families is, I'm too busy, I can't cook three or four different types of meals for the whole family, right? Anybody in that category? We can't do that. So what do you do? So this is one approach that my wife and I use when we give talks on family health, and I tell people, here's the at-risk family member. So I'll take our family, for example, okay? I've had a tendency toward insulin resistance before, which is why I'm so passionate about this, but I've got 14-year-old twin boys. They're six feet tall and they play basketball and they're very physically active. There's no way they're gonna be on the same diet as me. So if we have pasta night, maybe I'll do spaghetti squash or zucchini noodles. The kid's gonna have whole wheat pasta, whatever. But then the entire family is gonna have the salad, the same sauce that we make together, and then we'll have fresh fruit. We just switched out the starches. For Indian night, I might have cauliflower rice, which Prerna um, will talk to you about, and which was on your menu today as well too. The coconut chapatis or other types of flatbreads are lowering carbs. My kids, they can have rice quinoa, they can have regular flatbreads if they want to, no problems with that at all. The same vegetable curry, the same meat curry, the same salad for all of us. Mexican nights, I might do more burrito bowls or lettuce wrap type foods. They can have tortilla, they can have some rice, no issues. Again, the same filling, guacamole, some sour cream cheese, those things are okay for us. In Asian nights, you get the picture. We're just switching out the starch part, which is easy to do, but we wanna keep the other foods, no matter what type you are, if you're inflammation, insulin resistant, LDL type, everybody should be eating healthy salads, fresh fruit, and natural ingredients. That should be the common core for all of our families. And just switch out a few of the things that people have issues with. So if we have patients that are gluten intolerant, they're not gonna have the flat breads, they might have a little bit of rice or quinoa. Somebody can handle some gluten, they might have the whole wheat bread. So those are the things that you can modify around the edges. So fasting has become very popular. You know, we abbreviate intermittent fasting or IF. And we, we can see tremendous impact. When people fast in a very healthy manner, we can reverse diabetes, we can cause game-changing improvements in health. So time-restricted eating is another way to think about fasting where you take eight hours in your day where you eat all of your calories. So let's say you eat from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. or from 10 to 6 or whatever. Pick your eight-hour window, eat all your foods, hopefully mostly healthy foods then, and then you fast for the rest of the time. So that means non-caloric beverages, herbal teas, water, all that stuff's okay, but you avoid other foods. Now, it can, if you do this the right way, there are studies, we see increased longevity in animal studies, 
Definitely reduce insulin resistance, inflammation goes down, lower cancer occurrence and recurrence, especially in breast cancer. Studies have shown that intermittent fasting reduces breast cancer recurrence, so significant impact there. Now tips, breakfast skipping, people don't, sometimes fasting might be a little bit scary, you know, the concept, but for a lot of people, if you skip breakfast or push it out and you have an earlier dinner the night before, that's fasting, because sleeping counts as fasting, right? So try to end eating by 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., Again, consume non-caloric beverages during that time. And it is really more successful if you're eating healthy. I sometimes get some busy execs. They come in and tell me, I'm fasting already. I'm too busy to eat, eat breakfast. I skip lunch, and then I just eat dinner. But then they eat a really unhealthy dinner, and they're under chronic stress the whole time. That's really not healthy fasting. You want to make sure your recovery meal is really good and make sure you're eating really the, the, the right quality foods here. But basically, if you finished eating your dinner by 7 p.m. and you had a late breakfast at 11 a.m., right, you're already fasting for well over, what, 16 hours, basically. So that's a major intermittent fast. So I talk about safe ways to do it and some of the myths about fasting in a dedicated blog post here. So moving on to exercise, a couple of things with exercise. So why do we need to exercise? So a couple of goals here. Number one, when our muscles are active, they have a demand for energy. They have a demand for more carbs. So I tell people often in my lectures, you need to squat for your rice, okay? Because when you are engaging large muscle groups and then you eat rice after that, more of the rice traffic is gonna to go to the muscle. If you've been monitoring your activity throughout the day, you've been in meetings all day, your muscles don't have much demand for energy, so then you have to be very careful with the amount of carbs you're taking in. So creating muscle parking space is one thing. The other thing is regular physical activity lowers glucose, cholesterol, and it lowers inflammation levels, assuming you're not over-exercising. If you're over-exercising, inflammation levels might be high. So there's a delicate balance. Some of my type A patients, I have to scale back their exercise because it is triggering more inflammation in their body. Okay, so total body type exercises. So when my patients go into the weight room, if you have 15 to 20 minutes, warm up first and go straight to the legs because nobody wants to work their legs out. They'll do their upper body first and like, I'll just skip the legs. Go straight for the legs or do total body. Again, my rickshaw theme is pervasive here, but lifting type activities that engage all your major muscle groups. If you even took dumbbells or grocery bags and did this 10, 15 times throughout the day, it's gonna activate a lot of those large muscle groups, which can lower inflammation and really help with the insulin resistance issues. So work on those types of exercises. Hit training or interval training is another way. So if you walk at a steady pace for 20 minutes, you're not gonna clear much parking space. But if you walk fast for a minute, slow for 30 seconds. Whenever you alternate any type of physical activity in a spike form fashion, you create more parking space. Even for seniors, they show that seniors that walk, if they walk a little bit fast and then slow, fast and then slow, their glucose levels are better. They clear more parking space. Multiple ways to do it. Tabata is one of the ways to do it. So there's some apps I recommend. The Tabata app is one I used to use. I've been using seconds. You can incorporate any type of exercise into this. Your yoga, so your namaskar, whatever you want to do, do it in an interval fashion. You'll see better results from that. Okay? So real quickly, a lot of numbers here, but I just want to show you a case example. This is a patient that followed a lot of her guidelines, triglycerides, HDL, everything got better. But this number right here, here's the C-reactive protein. We want that to be less than three, less than one's even better. It was 10.6, we made dietary changes, it went to 3.6. And then something magical happened between 3.6 and 0.6. There's only one single change he made. Started meditating, that's it. So meditation alone lowered inflammation levels, okay? I know Gopi's loving this part of the talk. He did not pay me to put this slide in here, right? So okay, but really, it is an anti-inflammatory. For many patients who are not Getting to their goal levels, this is it. The mindfulness, the slow practices, the sleep, all these things make a difference with inflammation. Okay, so again, you have so many resources here at Google. Google. Mindfulness practices, gratitude. Many of our patients need psychotherapy. They've had early childhood trauma. You know, it's something we need to address. There is a technology for people that need tech motivation, HRV technology. I have dedicated videos on my site of how to use apps and devices to actually help you regulate uh, mindfulness using HRV technology can be pretty powerful, so you can check out some of those videos as more of a reference. Women's health challenges, okay, so the key thing I wanna make is emotional obesity. We call this emotional obesity because many of our women are eating the right foods, they're doing the right exercises, but they're not losing a single ounce, and a lot of it is becoming because they're not managing chronic stress. Stress for women causes more fat storage because for a woman's body, even if you decide not to have kids, it's programmed to protect you for lactation for pregnancy. So whenever there's chronic stress from workouts and from work, the body will hold on to fat. 
Many of our women, when they actually cut back that intensity and they're actually exercising less and less intense, they actually end up losing weight over the next several months. This is something we see over and over. It's a very tough cell to make, but we see quite a bit of it. And the reason is because of some of these. Chronic stress disrupts hormones and gut health. It can overactivate the immune system. Aggressive dieting exercise can backfire in these cases. So please keep that in mind. I'm going to push across some of this because I want um, Perna to get some time. Real quickly, the sleep connection I want to make for you is sleep and blood glucose. This is a major connection. Deep phase sleep usually reduces glucose. It produces more growth hormone, which helps us hold on to more muscle. Deep phase sleep primarily happens between 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So when patients tell me that they've slept eight hours, sleeping from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. is totally different than 10 to 6 because 10 p.m. is the golden window. I used to be a late nighter, but after looking at the studies, if I have work to do, I'll get up at 4.30 or 5 and do it, but I'm not gonna go to bed past 10, hardly ever. Okay, so really keep that in mind because it can impact the way the glucose is managed in the body. So earlier bedtimes is really critical, okay? So let me just finish off with a few last points here. So this is the main point I make to you. Parents are the ultimate genetic engineers our behaviors, our emotions. Now with epigenetic studies, we find the trauma in your grandparents actually affected your genes. So a lot of times if you have a kid and you're thinking, why are they so anxious? It may not be your predisposition. It could have been trauma they experienced as, you know, from the grandparents or the grandmother basically. So it's important that as we make these lifestyle changes, we're affecting the health of not our children, but actually our grandchildren as well. So these are all practices we need to incorporate into our daily lives. And this is a picture I want to show you because my father, that's not my dad, by the way. So, so who is this? So I just want to make the example. My father's an MD, PhD scientist. He passed away over a decade ago. But I thank God because what he used to do during his medical training is every day he used to go visit this guy to learn yoga and weight training. So literally without even knowing about epigenetics, he was already shaping like a healthier future for me and my brother. And this is actually the first and only Mr. Universe in India. His name is Manatesh Roy. And he trained Bikram Yoga, the famous Bikram you know, anthology. But I'm just telling you that now we have this knowledge, we should be able to make these changes so we can make our lives better and the lives of future generations much healthier too. And this is my example. Why am I so passionate? So now that you guys know all this knowledge, I'm sharing my own data with you guys, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm violating HIPAA here, but let me just show you real quickly. In 2009, look at my numbers. It's a perfect example. My total cholesterol, you might think, was really good, 154, but look at my triglycerides, way above at 314. My healthy cholesterol was 28, okay? My ratio, does anybody remember what should your ratio be? Less than three. Less than three. I was at 11.2 in 2009, right? And I was exercising almost every day, and I was eating steel-cut oats and everything. So now let's look at my numbers here. So my typical breakfast was a banana and steel-cut oats. I know from tracking my numbers, when I exceed 100 grams of carb per day, my parking problem begins. Steel-cut oats and banana together, 47 grams of net carb, right? That's already half my day's allowance. You switch over to Mediterranean omelet with veggies and cheese, 3 grams of net carb. So just by changing breakfast and making a few other changes, you can see how my ratio improved. It went from 11.2 to 1.6. Triglycerides dropped. HDL went up almost 20 points. People always think, HDL, I need to drink red wine, exercise more. No, it's coming from high triglycerides. You can see the inverse correlation right here. As triglycerides went down, HDL went up. So these are the powerful changes we make in the clinic that can reverse these sorts of conditions. Okay, Prairie, now I went a little bit over. Come on up. Okay. All right. I'm Prerna Upal and I'm a clinical dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. I work um, primarily with uh, Dr. Ron Sinha at the Los Altos Clinic, seeing patients as well as doing corporate wellness talks. I have over 20 plus years experience seeing patients with diabetes, obesity, heart disease, mostly at BAMF Los Altos. I'm a Bollywood dance instructor and an aerobics instructor and a longtime practitioner of meditation. I've been ma meditating my entire life. I also co-host the Bay Area radio show on South Asian health with Dr. Sinha. So I'm going to really present a lot of the practical uh, parts to all the scientific information that Dr. Ron has given. We are what we eat, so I want to highlight for you where the pitfalls are as you try to live a very practically healthy life. Are we the chemicals we eat? Some kind of chemical, either an additive, preservative, pesticide, herbicide, they're in all the foods we eat. 
you've probably been eating this yesterday, today, because it's on all the packaged foods that we purchase. These chemical compounds that are added to the foods are harmful, and several animal experiments have confirmed that they can cause cancer, birth defects, and harm our nervous system. It's for this reason that I do tell most of my patients to go organic whenever possible, because that's the one way to circumvent getting these chemicals in our diets. So what I want you to do is really focus on going chemical free. This is a wonderful website, ewg.org. It stands for environmentalworkinggroup.org. I think you're gonna get a copy of the slides, but you can definitely take a picture of this website. And it has a listing of um, what we call the Clean 15 and the Dirty 12, which tells you the most contaminated pesticide and, or pesticide and herbicide contaminated produce and the ones that uh, don't have them. So it's a great resource. Can I have a question? If it's a good question. If the food is organic, is it necessarily chemical free? For the most part, it is. Now, if you feel that you know, it's out of your budget and you don't want to buy organic, I would suggest getting local produce at the farmer's market. Get to know the farmers and just buy stuff that doesn't have um, chemicals sprayed. When you, get, when you look at this resource, it really does some amazing stuff. It highlights nutrition concerns in the food ingredient concerns and processing concerns. So it has a little barcode that it scans with your, if you have it on your phone, and it can give you a rating uh, from one to 10, with 10 being the worst score and one being the best. And what I like about it is once you get the rating, for instance, this bar, uh, the kind bar has a rating of six, it will also give you some other alternative foods that are um, healthier. A big part of my practical suggestions to you really comes down to reading the food label. We all know how to check the food label for fat, sugar, calories, and um, carbohydrates. However, it's important to do advanced label reading. And what do I mean by that? You need to take a look at all the harmful chemicals that are in all the foods that we are buying. Hormones, so, such as growth hormones. The US is one of the only countries where we're still using growth hormones to, um, uh, uh, sort of in our animals to increase milk production. High fructose corn syrup. Now high fructose corn syrup, along with MSG, is uh, what we call them are the obesogenic chemicals. So they actually increase fat storage. High fructose corn syrup actually impacts two different hormones in the body. One is insulin, it raises insulin levels, and which is a fat-promoting hormone, and it also decreases your leptin level. Leptin is your appetite-regulating hormone. So when you have less leptin, you're going to be more hungry. Artificial sweeteners, we do know that they are again chemicals and we're not necessarily seeing the benefit or the marketing um, uh, sort of claim that they had made. They were invented or made because we thought we were going to a uh, ward of diabetes. They were going to be sugar substitutes. There are a lot of studies showing that these artificial sweeteners uh, increase your metabolic syndrome risk, which is insulin resistance risk, to almost 67%. So they're not really helping the diabetes epidemic. Trans fats, these are hydrogenated fats, which we know are very detrimental to health. I will allude to it a little later in the presentation. Food dyes, believe it or not, if you look at food products in Europe, for instance, you will notice that they use natural food coloring from plants and vegetables as food dyes, whereas we here in the US are using uh, carcinogenic chemicals. So when you look at colors like blue, one, blue number one, blue number two, or yellow number five, number six, red number two, number 40, uh, read the research on them. They raise the risk for cancer. Red 40 is linked to breast cancer. So just, again, watch out for these food dyes. Carrageenan. Carrageenan is used as an emulsifier. It comes from a seaweed. And it's used in dairy products and non-dairy products. So not just milk and yogurt to emulsify and thicken and give it uh, the creamy consistency, but it's also used in all the non-dairy milks, whether it's soy milk, hemp milk. Um, they do have um, uh, carrageenan used as an emulsifier. 
MSG is uh, also called an excitotoxin, so it really gets you to crave more food. Uh, dough conditioners. So dough conditioners are also used in a lot of breads. Look for this word when you see breads. There's one specific one that caught uh, our attention a few years ago. It's called azodi carbonamide, and it's the same chemical that's used in yoga mats to give it the spongy effect. So that's what was being used in the in a lot of the breads that we eat. You know, brands like Pillsbury, Sara Lee, uh, Subway was uh, a chain that got a lot of pressure then to to sort of take azodi carbonamide out of their products. Uh, preservatives like BHA and BHT, they're used in a lot of fats and oils to extend their shelf life. Again, um, these are banned all over the world, but we're still using them in the US, and they have known also to be carcinogenic. Uh, bisphenol A, BPA, is used in food packaging and also the lining of cans. Again, um, carcinogenic and unhealthy. I want you to start familiarizing yourself with this. So you know, I have an example for you. Do any of you recognize this food? Look at all the ingredients. I mean, you know, I always tell my patients, you want to get foods that have five or less ingredients because that's as close to natural as possible. Any guesses? Cereal. Like Sorry? Cereal. cereal, that's a that's close. It's a breakfast item. A uh, it's not a muffin. So it's really interesting. You're, it's, it's a breakfast item, and you're all seeing that it's got the wheat flour, so it has to be some sort of a grain food. Here we go. You know, the one thing I want to point out before I show you what it is, look at dried blueberries. I highlighted that because this is, again, a marketing gimmick. They're going to fool you by sort of just uh, dangling a carrot in front of you and saying, hey, guess what? We've got some dried blueberries in here. If you look at dried blueberries, they're laden with sugar. And so, again, a smattering of those dried blueberries doesn't necessarily make the product healthy. These are Eggo waffles, um, and they call it blueberry flavor just because they've thrown in, a, thrown in a few blueberries. Now, this is something that you and I would probably give our kids um, for breakfast. Keep in mind, you saw the number of ingredients on there. So as we're looking at these ingredients, um, Dr. Sinha talked about the omega-6 fats, that's the canola oil, soybean oil. Those are the omega-6 fats. These are industrialized seed oils, which are processed with hexane and petroleum-based products, and they are, have been shown in scientific experiments to uh, cause inflammation. Then, of course, we've got the sugars. We've got uh, modified cornstarch. Um, you've seen the food coloring, the blue number two, red number 40. So just really watch out for these ingredients that I've been talking about. Another one for you guys. Any guesses for this product? And don't miss the number of ingredients, 43 ingredients. When you see what product it is, uh, keep that in mind. Again, you will see a whole lot of omega-6 inflammatory oils, partially hydrogenated oil, which is a source of trans fat. You've got monosodium glutamate, the excitotoxin um, chemical, which is going to make you crave more food and eat more. Um, coloring, the food coloring, safflower oil again, uh, which is the inflammatory omega-6. Any guesses? Mashed potatoes. Oh, somebody said Pringles. Who said Pringles? Yeah, very good. That is pretty impressive. So it's interesting how they calling it baked. So again, it's a marketing stint, right? But it's, yeah, it's Pringles loaded baked uh, potato. 43 ingredients. I make French fries for my kids at home. And it's three ingredients. I have salt, got the potato, and I have a little bit of oil and I bake it. So you don't need to have that many ingredients. How about identifying this food? Look at the ingredient list. Mixed organic, green, alternative. Absolutely. See how, <laughs> see how easy that is? Was that easy to guess versus the other two slides I showed you? So you want to look for this sort of stuff when you read your food labels. Look at those ingredients. You want to have a real food. Foods that are real do not usually have an ingredient list. So when I go to the farmer's market and I pick up my vegetables and fruit, there's no food label there. It doesn't need one. 
however, if fresh food has an ingredient list, most likely you will not find any additives or preservatives or food dyes, um, just fresh produce. So we have a new food label coming up this year. And one of the differences from the old label and the new label is uh, we're probably going to see no trans fat because there's a lot of lobbying going on to uh, FDA wants to remove them from uh, the foods. But the biggest change over here is you're going to see added sugars, which is something we dietitians have gotten very excited about. Because when you look at the total sugar, you have no idea if this is natural or added. And it's really nice for us to know that. So you're going to know the added sugars. And also look at the different micronutrient profiles at the very bottom. If you look at the old label, it did not have vitamin D. And so it's uh, highlighting some of these nutrients that we should be paying a little more attention to. So where do we start with all this practical information? You need to make sure that your env environment is very, very supportive, out of sight, out of mind. If I start a cook and I don't have all the right uh, ingredients, I'm not going to be able to prepare what I'm planning to do. So you need to secure your environment, and it takes place in two steps. One is the pantry purge. The other one is restocking the pantry with the right foods. So what are some of the things I would advise you to remove from your pantry? Start by taking everything out of your pantry shelf by shelf. I know it sounds cumbersome, but I'm going to share a case study with you at the end and tell you how even a simple change, which doesn't seem to sort of factor in in a big way, does, does really have the positive impact. Discard refined, highly processed whites, white bread, white pasta, white sugar, empty calorie sugary foods, sweetened cereals, pastries, soda, sweetened drinks, high fructose corn syrup, agave, highlighting all of the things you need to watch out for in the ingredient list of those packages and discard them. Choose real foods, not chemicals. And so avoid the additives, preservatives like BHA, BHT, sulfites, the dyes, the emulsifiers, dough conditioners, all the stuff that I just talked about. Lunch and meats tend to contain nitrates and nitrites. They by themselves may not be a problem, but when they're heated, they turn into a compound called nitrosamines, which is a known carcinogen. OK, so we, uh, Dr. Ron and I have a lot of patients who are now on this uh, gluten-free bandwagon. You don't need to go gluten-free unless you really have a need, unless you've got celiac disease. And it's really 1% of the population that has that condition. But uh, what about the ingredients in these gluten-free foods? A lot of people think they're healthy. <coughs> so this is one gluten-free item. It's um, tortillas. And I want you to look at the ingredient list here. Again, I'm always emphasizing that for the food to be as close to nature as possible, you want to go for five ingredients or less. Here we've got tapioca starch. This is the primary starch that acts as a wheat replacer in gluten-free foods. It has no fiber. It has no micronutrients. It has a very high glycemic index, which means it get, uh, spikes your blood sugar very rapidly. Um, sweet rice flour, tapioca syrup, cane syrup, corn syrup, just look at all the sugar and carbohydrates that are coming into this food. So read those food labels carefully, because just because it's gluten-free, it doesn't mean that it's a healthy product. So when I talked about trans fats earlier, and I said I will allude to it later in the presentation, uh, this is one of the things I hear practically every time I'm doing a diet history or a food recall from my patients, especially the South Asian community. They're having a lot of these snacks with their afternoon chai, or they're having it at night. And um, just keep in mind that not only are they high in carbohydrates, but they're a source of trans fat. Now, it's true that we're trying to get trans fat out of our diet, but if you look at the FDA guidelines currently, it says that it's okay to have 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving of food. Now, we don't usually have just one serving of snacks like this. That would be half a cup. So let's say that from different foods you've had 0.5 grams, or from a single food you had more than one serving, if you come up to two servings, you've crossed your safe limit for the two grams of trans fat. You've crossed your safe limit for the day. Other things to purge from the pantry, the omega-6 industrialized seed oils that, that Ron had alluded to, canola oil, corn oil, 
Uh, Gopi, you wanted to know which ones they were. So soybean oil, cottonseed oil, sunflower, safflower, all the vegetable oils, um, mixed vegetable oils. Again, when you look at those um, crispy Indian snacks, the slide that I showed you, and you look at the label, it says edible vegetable oil. You don't know what oil they're using, but it's most likely uh, an omega-6. So very good question. Uh, what oils should we be replacing this with? What are the healthy oils? The healthy oils would be, um, so in terms of high temperature cooking, you want an oil that has a higher smoking point. That would be avocado oil. That's what I would use. Uh, coconut oil is also um, a healthy saturated fat. Uh, sometimes you can use um, grass-fed ghee. That also has a very high smoke point. Now, I don't really recommend my patients do a lot of frying, but if you wanted to use an oil for high temperature cooking, those would be the oils to use. If you're not doing high temperature cooking, extra virgin olive oil cold pressed would be my go-to. A um, lot of studies showing that it's a wonderful oil. Um, hope that answers your question. Uh, so now that we've purged a lot of stuff from our pantry, what are some of the things we're restocking? What are we bringing in? Minimally processed, unprocessed carbohydrates. We're looking for whole grain. Now, again, watch out. You might see labels that say whole grain. It doesn't mean it's whole grain. You've got to look on the label for the fiber content. If it has four grams of fiber per serving, the food is classified as a high fiber containing food. These are some of the products that I recommend to my patients. In terms of bread, it would be Ezekiel bread or the sprouted grain whole wheat bread from um, Alvarado Bakery. And these breads are available in the health food frozen section of, of most stores of Whole Foods. You can find this there. Uh, pasta, again, you wanna look for uh, quinoa pasta, uh, Ancient Grains is another, uh, True Roots is another company that has a really good pasta and some other good uh, unprocessed products. Late July, I like to, if I want to serve some tortilla chips, I'll get late July chips. Rivita makes crackers, multigrain crackers, and Mary's gone crackers. Keep in mind, again, they all have carbohydrates, so fit them into your carb intake for the day. All carbs are not created equal. Um, the glycemic index is a way for you to know how fast your blood sugar level spikes from a given carbohydrate. You want to pick carbohydrates that are low GI, low glycemic index. And one um, sort of uh, example I wanted to point out here was instant oatmeal versus steel cut oats. Look at the difference in the glycemic index. I had a patient and I presented his case study at one of my previous talks and that was one of the changes we made in his diet and we brought a lot of his numbers down just making changes like this. So we all know to eat more fruits and vegetables. I've told you to try and uh, get them organic. Protein, somebody here had a question on protein. Some of the protein sources for vegetarians would be nuts, legumes and lentils. Uh, I also recommend um, dairy products. So for instance, Greek yogurt, it has half the carbs and twice the protein. Um, those would be some of the sources. Soy products like tempeh, which is um, fermented soy, tofu, paneer would be some good sources of protein. We are bombarded with a lot of choices as we all know, so make sure you choose the right foods. I do recommend to my patients when they're looking for dairy to get grass-fed dairy products. You don't have to, they are pricey. You can go with products like Strauss or Organic Valley, but Organic Valley does make a grass milk and I love the Maple Hill Creamery uh, grass-fed products. Nutrition, I wanna point out that you cannot take one ingredient and say, well, I'm gonna take this in a pill form because this is what's going to really help me. It's a synergistic effect. The nutrients work in harmony together and give us the health benefits that we see. There's um, a perfect match is black pepper with turmeric. So I'm sure you've heard a lot about how turmeric has all these wonderful properties, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. Uh, it contains a compound called curcumin and black pepper contains a compound called piperine, and when combined, it increases, piperine increases the absorption of curcumin 2,000%. When you add fat to that equation, again, it enhances absorption. Another really good uh, combination uh, for vegetarians is when you have green leafy vegetables which are high in iron, adding vitamin C increases absorption because red meat 
uh, is much easily absorbed, but we need the vitamin C for vegetarian foods. So I picked these recipes that I had submitted today for your menu. This is the baked salmon, and I wanted to highlight how I brought in these synergistic uh, herbs to give you those anti-inflammatory benefits. There was turmeric and pepper in them. Another uh, recipe that uh, was in your cafeteria today was uh, the, f uh, the fat with the turmeric and black pepper because that's really how you're getting turmeric's full potential. Cruciferous vegetables we know have anti-cancer benefits. Kale, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, arugula, uh, all of them have um, they are micronutrient dense. When we are talking about nutrient dense foods, these are high on our list. Again, look at all the different nutrients they contain because that's what's going to really give you that benefit. Sulforaphane is the compound that really gives us the anti-cancer property. I'll end with the case study. And again, I've never done a case study that was so simplistic. It's usually a lot of biometrics. But this is a patient of mine who came in and, uh, as Ron mentioned, one of the inflammatory markers is gastric uh, symptoms. And that's what she presented with, a lot of gastric acidity, bloating. Um, some of the things that I recommended to her were all the things that I've discussed here today, but she was she jumped into action. She said she had tried losing weight for years. She tried every possible program on the market. Nothing had worked, and she said, I'm not sure you can help me, but you're my last resort. We discussed all the things I talked about today. She was very motivated. She actually went and did the pantry purge. She did the pantry restock, and she called it my clean eating refrigerator. And here were pictures that she mailed to me of her healthy kitchen. And she had, she said, I haven't brought in the grass-fed dairy yet, but I've started really getting in a lot of the micronutrients, lots of produce. Uh, she was bringing in healthier oils and uh, healthier fats. And shopping at health places, farmer's markets. She got... Um, a really uh, healthy oil from Whole Foods. So she was really reading food labels and bringing in all the right foods. She lost, um, I don't know if I had it in here, no, 14 and a half pounds in two months. And she said she has even more energy than she ever did. She doesn't feel she's on a diet. There's no calorie counting. It's just making healthy changes. So this is what the healthy plate should look like. Half your plate should be vegetables and the other half should have three segments, proteins, carbohydrates, and healthy fats. Sure. We told you it was going to be information packed, right? So we're like, I've got a lot of resources on my blog as well. So I write on all these topics. Perna has co-written a lot of topics here too. So we're out there for you. And this is our PAMP resource right here. So I know we have a little time left and we still have enough people in here. So we can open up to any questions you guys have. Perna, do you want to come on up too? Sure, thanks. People are very busy. And uh, one of the things that's coming up a lot, and this is especially for kids, as especially college-going kids, is things like Soylent as a breakfast substitute. Um, it's supposed to be very good, and I just wanted to ask what 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 your recommendations about are about that. So, so my take with anything, as I said, was minimally processed. I want us to go back to our ancestral way of eating, and our ancestors never had food from packages. So, my recommendation would be to go down to the basics. Just give the kids as minimally processed foods as possible. Yeah. So this is more about college kids who are not at home, who cannot. Instead, they're just grabbing a bagel or something, and they're, so this is my daughter actually, is it? Right. She was asking me about that, and she's like, can I have this instead of right. grabbing a bagel? Is it, isn't it? So, you know, once in, I have a kid in college, at Berkeley right now, and so she battles with her diet as well because I programmed her to do things a certain way. <laughs> and so you can, uh, you know, once in a while, it's not going to sort of really uh, hurt them. But on a regular basis, I will... Every other weekend, I don't know if that's a possibility for you, go and do some grocery shopping and stock her refrigerator. So get them some healthy things. I get her Greek yogurt. I get her a lot of berries. Tell her to put flaxseed or chia seeds on it. Um, doing stuff like that. Or um, if they can access eggs, right? I mean, at the dining hall, they can do eggs. So that, like Ron pointed yeah. out, with his meal change. You know, the food did. combination she brought up is key. I mean, they've shown studies of meat. If you have a burger patty and you put avocado on it, 
it lowers inflammation by up to 40%. So, so, those are, so sometimes you're in an environment where you, that main protein might be not that healthy, but you try to surround it with the right foods. You know, if you, uh, one day I'm gonna take a picture of my office shelves and you'll see I've got olive oil, I've got avocado oil, I've got turmeric and pepper, and sometimes we have catered lunches and I completely modify the lunch that I'm eating by adding those to sort of bulletproof it against some of the inflammation that can happen. So there's a lot of tips and tricks you can do for that. Thanks. Yeah. Amazing information. I like that it, you have very specific examples. I think that's what helps us kind of adopt change. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, intermittent fasting. Thank you for bringing that up. Smoothies. If, if you want to skip breakfast, what are your thoughts on doing an avocado smoothie with spinach and all that stuff um, before noon? So uh, smoothies, again, if they're vegetable based, and you're using a lot of greens, not using added sugars. Avocado is fabulous to add. Sometimes when the smoothie is ready, I'll add some chia seeds. But absolutely, you can have them. I usually will recommend patients do it if they've worked out. Because I would rather you eat your greens than drink your greens. But as long as, you know, blenders like Vitamix keep the fibers intact, sure. And then also people that have a lot of digestive issues, sometimes soups and smoothies is what they have to do because they cannot absorb the nutrients at all. So that's another situation where those types of foods might be okay. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm curious why the start and end times of sleep uh, matter and not just the duration. I've never heard that before. Uh-huh. So the start and end times. So I'll give you an example. So, so basically what happens typically after sundown, our body's digestive hormones shut down. I tell people our digestive hormones are like a shop. And when the sun goes down, they shut down because of the release of melatonin. So at nighttime, when the sun goes down, our brain produces more melatonin. And one of the things melatonin does, it prevents the pancreas from producing digestive hormones and insulin. What that means is if I have white rice at 12 noon versus 9 p.m., the blood sugar spike from that same rice will be much more dramatic. So a lot of the food, that's why compressing that food. So there's a researcher down in Southern California in the San um, La Jolla, and he's shown that even if you don't change people's diets, even if they're eating the same garbage, if you at least tell them to finish eating the garbage by 6 p.m., they do tremendously well. Not ideal, but they still have profound benefits because between 6 p.m. and their breakfast the next day, maybe at 8 a.m., the liver is doing detox. The brain's doing detox as well too, but the liver is at least able to process. It's to back-to-back -back eating. So when you eat later, you go to bed later, a lot of those um, anti-inflammatory hormones and digestive processes just can't be activated at all. So that's why that has become key, is really that earlier time, so, yep. So you were mentioning that for women, high intensity exercises is not as effective. And mm -hmm. so wh where's, is that um, a broad brush approach or is it like, what? What is the theory around that? Okay, so let me tell you at a high level. So I, I literally saw a patient this morning in clinic, and she's the one that's been sort of running, training for a half marathon, and she's 30 pounds overweight. And what I identified, I looked at her workout schedule, and she runs about 30, 40 miles a week. And four days a week, she's doing running, basically. I actually looked at her heart rate because she had an Apple Watch, and I realized based on her heart rate that she's exercising anaerobically, which means her heart rate is at a high level while she's running. And one quick equation you can think of is if you were to measure heart rate while exercising, like on a machine or using a watch or whatever, 180 minus your age. If you take 180, subtract your age, whatever value you have there, if you're exceeding that during your workouts, you're constantly in anaerobic zone. And anaerobic workouts to some degree are helpful, but if that's all you're doing, what happens is when you exercise at the anaerobic high intensity level, you're burning predominantly sugar, okay? So that's good news if you're trying to clear parking space, but the bad news is your body's constantly craving sugar. And it's very difficult to manage your diet if most of your workouts are at that level. So I did a recent blog post, so just to make it simple, and I talk about how to exercise in the proper way, but you need to have enough base aerobic foundation. That's gonna be lower intensity, but that actually burns more fat and it doesn't generate that hunger. Now, if you're doing high intensity and your metabolism's adapted for it, you're losing weight, you feel energetic, you're not craving junk all the time, that's the right exercise for you. But for many women, they're doing way too much anaerobic and their diet is off the charts. And I call this practice compensatory eating. People that will go to the gym for an hour and then they refill their bodies and overfill their bodies because they think, hey, I'm training for a half marathon, I can eat what I want but the equation's kind of messed up. So it really depends, you know? So that's why we do like to personalize the exercise depending on their risks and behavior, so, yeah. I yeah. just want to add to that, that um, I've never really tried to lose weight per se. I just want to exercise to um, stay fit and hit is the only thing that's actually 
made yeah. me lose like 30 pounds in a year or so. Yeah, absolutely. Without trying. Hit, so when it works, it, it actually, can be very effective for people who do it the right way. And actually, after hit, if you walk, that's even better. If you can do walking after hit, you actually unlock even more fat burning. So great question. Yeah. So one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. So sure. all this is incredible. So clearly, the science is now available. Our forefathers didn't have access to it. Sure, right. But the bad news is also seems extremely complicated, uh, understanding all this and incorporating it into your life. Yes. Combined with a packaged food industry with all its clever marketing that can pull you in the opposite direction. Yeah. So what is your recommendation in the most simple and easy and effective way we can make this a regular daily living habit? Great point. You want to yeah. give some feedback? Yeah. Sure. So one of the things is go natural. Just buy as few processed and packaged foods as you can. I try to always remember how my grandmother ate because she used to spend a lot of time with us. And there was no packaged food. So I go and I buy real ingredients, whether it's lentils or I'm a vegetarian, so whether it's lentils, garbanzo beans, or it's the produce at the farmer's market, I source it from the right place, I'll make sure it's organic, I'd rather cut corners there than someplace else. And uh, I barely have any packaged food in the house. Then given all the chemicals, I also don't buy canned foods. There are some companies, there's one called Native Forest and one called Eden Foods, which don't have the BPA lining. So there are some products where I might sort of go to get coconut milk by Native Forest, which doesn't have BPA, but it's always natural foods, not in a package. And, and you know, there that's... are a lot of fast um, foods that you can do quick. I'll give you an example of my breakfast. So sometimes I'm in a rush in the morning. If I'm not intermittent fasting, I've got a microwave egg boiler. I top, you know, I'm literally while I'm showering, the eggs are done. I put them in a container with an avocado and I'm out the door. On my non-egg morning, sometimes I'm too lazy to even wash berries. I've got frozen organic berries. I have a small container. I put full fat Greek yogurt in there handful of those um, frozen berries. By the time I get to the office, it's defrosted. I've got flax seeds and things in my office. I sprinkle it on there. I'm done. So I think a lot of times we just get inert. But if you get a little creative around the principles that we talked about, now I would say there's garbage out there, but there's a lot of good foods that are coming out that are very convenient. Um, there's a lot more options, even in the regular grocery stores, because they're trying to compete with Whole Foods. You can find a lot. And you can order. like So through Amazon, or I'm blanking on the other name, Thrive Market. If you've heard of Thrive, they're a subscription-based service, very high quality foods that will come straight to your doorstep. All the criteria will fulfill Prerna's you know, ideas. So, so there's more and more options that are out there. So I think that's what we have to start looking at. You've got to really now. plan yeah. ahead. I think the key is planning ahead. Put aside a couple hours on the weekend as you're getting started. Get the right ingredients at home and just plan ahead. And then come see us if you need help. Find a dietitian or somebody. Come to the retreat to get, or, yeah, yeah, the retreat will have a lot more practical We'll have a lot of practical advice. Great. So, all right, great. Thank, thank, you, thank you, guys. Uh, yeah. Brenna, hey, thank Dr. you so much. Thank you so much, Thank you so much, Great. Yeah. Thank you.